great to be here today um, with two of the country's really preeminent experts on the Chinese economy. One is my colleague, uh, Tom Dusterberg, who's a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute. And another is Leland Miller, who I have the pleasure of, of just meeting today. Uh, Tom is an expert on trade, manufacturing, economics, and foreign policy. He leads a project at Hudson on trade with Europe and China, reform of the World Trade Organization, global competition in advanced technologies such as 5G, and the strength of the US manufacturing sector. And I've had the pleasure of working with him on several of these projects. Leland Miller is a leading authority on China's economy and financial system. He's the co-founder and CEO of the China Beige Book International. He was a capital markets attorney based out of New York and Hong Kong, and he has a law degree from the University of Virginia. Leland is an elected member of the National Committee on US-China Relations and the Economic Club of New York. So I'll start with some high level observations about Tom's new report, which you can find on the Hudson Institute website. That report is called Economic Cracks in the Great Wall of China. Is China's current economic model sustainable? I'll describe some of my takeaways from the report and then turn to Tom to go in depth on some of his findings, Leland to respond to Tom's analysis, and then we'll get into a discussion of policy options and some questions. First, overall, Tom's report argues that fundamentally there are several long-term structural problems and various short-term policy initiatives that are undermining China's long-term economic dynamism. He argues that China's growth will likely be weakened by a combination of increased control by the state, a focus on older population, less innovation, and the deliberate undermining of some of China's faster growing sectors, which we can get into during the discussion. In addition, overall, Tom challenges the common assumption that growth in the PRC will continue. And he argues that most analysts are not understanding the extent of the danger of economic crises in China today. Fundamentally, he asks whether President Xi's vision of reinventing and imposing a state-directed CCP-dominated model can actually happen? Will it succeed? And by better understanding these weaknesses, the crux of his report is looking at policy options that we have so that we can identify where and how the United States can develop and craft targeted tools to support US policy objectives. So I'll turn now to Tom. He'll do a much better and more detailed explanation of uh, what's in his report and his findings. And then as noted, I'll turn to Leland. So Tom, please take it away, thank you. Okay, thank you Nadia for uh, being with us today and uh, to Leland as well for taking the time to go through this long paper and give his uh, uh, vast uh, uh, body of knowledge uh, to take a close look at, at uh, my arguments. So as, uh, as Nadia, you, you pointed out, I'm gonna, I, I see some longer term structural problems and some acute political and economic problems that make it difficult, I think, for anyone, let alone an authoritarian um, leader like Xi Jinping to manage this, uh, what I think is a, a looming crisis. So let me uh, go quickly over what I think are some of the structural problems. Some of these are well known, so I'll, I'll glide over them without too much detail. First is the demographic issue, which has been widely noted. Population uh, is about to start to decline or perhaps has already started to decline. And it's severely aging, falling by over 15% uh, in the next 15 years. Um, uh, the uh, working age population is falling by about 15% over the next 15 years. By 2050, it's estimated that about a half a billion people will be over the age of 50. Uh, over the age of 60 and require uh, extensive uh, support through the social welfare system. So second, the social welfare medical systems in China are underdeveloped, especially in comparison to uh, Western models, but also are underfunded. Uh, this issue drives up the precautionary savings among the Chinese people and undermines the attempts by Xi Jinping to shift, shift the economy to a consumer-oriented, self-sufficient model, which Xi seeks to uh, guide China into. Third, um, there's an unequal distribution of income 
uh, both vertically and geographically. The IMF noted in a paper a few years ago that um, the, uh, from being one of the most equitable, equitable economies in 1990, China now has inequality that is higher than in most regions with inequality in urban regions rising more uh, sharply. Um, this uh, 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 inequality extends to um, uh, also the education system, to job opportunities uh, and opportunities for women. Um, a noted China scholar at uh, Hoover Institution, Elizabeth Economy calls uh, notes that this could cause what she calls social fragmentation. She says discrimination based on gender and ethnicity is rampant and severe urban rural inequality persists. Women only uh, represent 5% of the central committee of the CCP, of the Chinese Communist Party, um, and wages are well below the uh, average for men uh, by women in China. So that this is all a potential source of social unrest in a slowing economy, especially. Fourth, I note there's environmental degradation, air, water, uh, uh, ground soil. Uh, this uh, undercuts agricultural self-sufficiency, self water shortages leading to tension with South Asia as China seeks to control major river systems from the Himalayas. Uh, fifth, there's a lack of raw materials. Uh, China lacks the ability to be self-sufficient in food, energy, and minerals that are needed for its industrial powerhouse. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative tries to compensate uh, for these shortages, but results in tensions with the rest of the world. Now, let me turn to Xi Jinping's economic and political uh, uh, path that he's uh, gradually articulated and put into practice since he came to power uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, this uh, uh, new direction for the Chinese economy, I think, undermines growth. Despite the desire to become more self-sufficient and build world-dominating industry, Xi's return to authoritarian rule is upending growth and dis discouraging creative entrepreneurship in China. He, uh, this new policy favors state-owned enterprises over the private sector. Uh, estimates are that uh, some, the uh, state-owned enterprises are some 30% less productive than those in the Chinese private sector and only 20% uh, as productive uh, at least in the industrial sector, as those in the uh, advanced uh, economies of the West. Um, she is also increasing the size of the, uh, increasing the role of the Chinese Communist Party officials in com company management boards, offer, often um, in enhancing political rather than economic efficiency as the goals of uh, management. Next, uh, uh, Xi's drive against um, um, uh, successful new services in both digital and services uh, oriented firms and large successful firms in general. Um, for, for example, he undercut uh, Jack Ma's uh, Alibaba uh, and other uh, large successful companies, but also fast growing digital marketplace place um, uh, companies um, such as uh, ride sharing, video gaming, uh, and innovative health providers and private education providers. Uh, overall, China must now devote seven to nine yuan or units of currency to get one uh, yuan of higher GDP compared to one to two yuan uh, to, to uh, achieve the same goal of a, an advance of GDP of, of one yuan uh, in the go-go years of the 1990s. Now, let me turn to some of the acute problems um, in, in China. Um, the diminishment of uh, the capital output ratio, which I just referred to, uh, along with the need for higher savings and low uh, productivity growth contribute uh, to the need for taking on higher and higher levels of debt. These levels now total, and I'm including both public and private, 
Uh, and it's sometimes hard to make a distinction between public and private debt because the uh, authorities at the central and local level often uh, implicitly assume responsibility for private debt. Um, because of this growing debt level, which is now well over 300% of GDP, China increasingly is looking abroad to finance that debt, which is likely to be a problem because of the growing Western recognition that its own economies are har harmed by China's merc mercantilist model. So the biggest short-term problem and is, is well known is the real estate bubble. In the 1990s, Be Beijing began to allow sales of land and local governments seized the opportunity to engineer um, in a boom in land development, uh, which helps them meet their goals of ambitious growth goals uh, set by Beijing. The self-reinforcing cycle of land sales, development, purchases by individuals as a form of savings and higher prices in the uh, real estate that has created a bubble much larger than that of the US and Europe in 2008, incomparable to the disastrous Japanese bubbles in the 1980s. Up to one third of the economy, maybe as much as one half uh, of the Chinese economy in the recent decade, uh, uh, recent two decades, has been attributable to the real estate sector. 80% uh, of personal wealth now is tied up in real estate. But more importantly, I think one third to one half of local government revenues from land sales and development taxes um, um, are the underpinning of the solvency of local governments, uh, local government finances. Um, now, in the last three or four years, the air is coming out of the bubble. Um, uh, uh, urban uh, dwellers now uh, have a home ownership, apartment ownership rate of about 90%. But also there are uh, a huge amount of vacant apartments uh, in urban areas. And they represent this vacancy rate represents somewhere around 10 years of supply based on urban, urban immigration patterns. Land sales and, and uh, prices uh, came steadily down in 2021, and many developers are defaulting, especially in dollar denominated or euro denominated debt. This dynamic, I think, is undermining local government finance, a very dangerous matter at a time when uh, local governments are expected to improve social welfare, pension shortages, education discrepancy, and environmental problems. Japan saw a weak economy for decades after the real estate bubble imploded and the US and Europe saw slow growth for at least four to five years after the great recession. And these were democratic nations uh, with respons uh, uh, officials responsible to an electorate uh, and private sector driven economies. So in summary, um, China's economy is already slowing and it looks very likely that it's gonna slow a great deal more. Can Xi Jinping manage to maintain both uh, high growth and social, social stability while returning to an authoritarian centrally planned model? He is still dependent uh, on foreign uh, sources of food, energy, capital, um, um, and minerals. Western countries have leverage if they decide to push back against Xi's merc mercantilism and expansionist military and economic programs. It's unclear in short what the source of strong growth in the future will be. And this could be a source of uh, some considerable, I think, political instability. So let me stop there. And uh, I, I look forward to, to the observations of, of, of my commentators. Great, Tom. Thanks so much. That's a, that's a perfect uh, segue into Leland um, and his comments. Uh, some of the material I've read from uh, Leland has actually offered some different viewpoints that the Chinese economy has not uh, been doing as poorly as commonly thought, and that in some sectors, I think, Leland, you put it, it's doing well enough. So I'd like you to comment a little bit, you know, is Tom exaggerating, um, looking at some of the structural weaknesses Weaknesses that Tom pointed out. Do you agree with them, or the extent of uh, the extent of these weaknesses? Um, thanks so much.
Uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Nadia. And, and thank you, Tom. I, I, I have to say that I actually really agree very strongly with, 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 with most of Tom's points. Um, I, I have articulated a view um, about the strength of the Chinese economy um, recently being uh, a bit stronger than people think, um, go at, least, at least into the last month or two. Uh, but I think that the, uh, there's a big difference between talking about the type of, of currents that I see, uh, you know, discussing these with, with financial clients, with corporate clients, in terms of the ebbs and flows of the Chinese economy. Uh, and something very different, which is identifying the long-term trends which policymakers and which others uh, watching China have to identify in terms of the next three to five to 10 years. Uh, and I very much identify closely with Tom's view that the economy is slowing, uh, that there are enormous challenges uh, at hand. And um, independent of the, the ebbs and flows we might see in the economy from, from, from month to month or quarter to quarter, uh, there are severe challenges that are being completely uh, underestimated by most people watching China today. Uh, you know, in fact, when I was looking at the paper, I was thinking to myself, you know, what, what are the giant takeaways that, that, that come to me? Now, I was soaking it all in, but as, as someone who, 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 was, who was talking about solutions at the end and, 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 and what the takeaways might be for people watching this, you know, three big takeaways really jumped out at me. Uh, the first was the focus of the paper, I think, was right. Uh, so much of the talk about China right now is about the hype of a rising China. Uh, if, you're, if you're in the policymaking community, then basically all you're talking about is, is, is the rising China threat. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know, that China has been rising for 20 years and, and, and that, that has continued. It's, it's certainly accurate. If you're in the Wall Street, Wall Street world, then you're talking about rising China as this land of wealth opportunity where fortunes could be made. But there's, there's not enough commentary right now on the enormous, enormous challenges that China uh, is looking at over the next two, five, 10, 20 years. Uh, the longer ones being, of course, related to demographics and environment and others, shorter term ones on the political side and even just, just switching up the growth model. So I think that this is quite welcome in that it sheds the idea that China, just because it's risen for 20 years, is, is going on this linear path to world domination, uh, but actually has enormous structural problems, enormous uh, economic and political and social challenges ahead of it. Uh, and, and so by doing that, I think it takes a much more realistic uh, view of, of, the, of, the, of the Chinese economic landscape um, to allow us to, to, to assess the, the solutions. Uh, second second uh, issue, and I'm not sure this is something that, that Tom took a strong uh, take on in the paper, but it's, you know, what might a, an economic crisis in China look like? Um, most people who, 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 who trade broadly or who, who, who don't spend a lot of time working on China uh, often think that, well, the United States had, a, had an economic crisis. We had Lehman. Uh, the Europeans then had a crisis. So the next crisis uh, will probably look a lot like that. So we're just waiting for China's next Lehman moment. I think every question I was asked around the Evergrande crisis was, is this China's Lehman moment? Is this China's Lehman moment? Uh, the answer for that was no. Uh, but the answer for, for will China have a Lehman moment, I think, is no. Um, the, the chances of an acute crisis hitting, I think, are actually very low uh, in terms of uh, what, what, what are, the, what, what are, the, what are the, the challenges that China will have in the coming years. The idea of, of China having this one big uh, moment where the system goes boom, um, I don't think that's very likely at all. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, China's a non-commercial financial system. It's very different from the United States, very different from the, from the European Union, uh, very different from most of the world. And what that means in a non-commercial financial system is that essentially uh, China can, can, can swoosh large tidal waves of capital from one side to the other in order to plug up gaps. You have defaults, no problem. You order them closed. You have other issues. Uh, you have bank runs. You, 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 know, you plug the gaps there. So the chances of there being one big boom moment, big boom moment, I think is very low for China, whether it's in the short term, even the medium term. Uh, but I think that the, the consequences of these challenges that Tom has laid out very well is that you're looking at a future of, of long-term stagnation. And one of the things that, that you, can, you, you, you keep seeing is that with all this buildup of debt, which is talked about um, on, on just about every page in the paper, huge amounts of debt, so much of it non-performing. You know, where is this going? Well, the system is now geared to, to, to pet, trying to chase this non-performing debt 
more and more capital is going to non-productive uses instead of productive uses, what does that do? It slows the economy down dramatically over time, and it leaves, leave, leaves it in a state where you're, you're, you have a future of very, very low growth and, and, and very likely stagnation. So I think that when we talk about where these challenges lead us, there's a very interesting question on, you know, what would an economic crisis look like? And, and you know, very, uh, very strongly feel that it, it, it's going to look like something very different than what we've seen in 2008 or, 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 or anything in, in the last several decades. Um, the last thing that jumped out at me is the solutions. So much of the, of the policy making communities and, and, and especially in Congress where, where being loud on China is, is, is a huge electoral advantage right now, regardless of your party. So much of it's about hitting China hard, hitting China everywhere. Uh, you know, how, how can we go uh, just go all out? Anything anti-China is bad. I think what these solutions did a very good job of is focus on the areas where we really should be uh, aggressively pushing back on Chinese ill intent. So focusing on, on areas uh, where China's misbehaving, you know, there's talk about reciprocity, market access, uh, 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 unfair subsidies, uh, central or local government subsidies. So areas where China's misbehaving or areas where we may be giving them the means to best us in the long run. So what's, what, what's happening on advanced technology? Are we providing them the means in order to, to give them an advantage to, uh, and, and threatening our national security as a result of that? I think so much of, uh, so many of the, of the solutions at the end fall to those two categories, which, which really gives it, uh, I think, a very strong thumbs up for me because they're very focused solutions. Uh, they'll get to the problem, but they're not they're not broad in the sense of you know the kind of problems that we looked at with with with, with across the board tariffs or other things where we're we're focusing on things that may may be as counterproductive to our own country as, as it is in terms of of, of reeling China back. Uh, so I, I I really enjoyed the paper uh, structurally. I I couldn't agree more with where I think the China uh, where, where Tom is saying the the, uh, the economy is going. Uh, but I look forward to uh, to, to a discussion about uh, anything we may uh, have some differences on. Great, Leland, thanks. Um, thanks so much. Uh, so let me just jump in a little bit and, and to your point about China's long-term um, economic stagnation, essentially a path of stagnation. Um, I think Tom, you probably agree with that characterization, right? Your, your, uh, that's what your report says as well, but what are the implications of that for both US businesses as well as, as US policymakers? Uh, so, you know, in, in one sense, does this mean we can kind of sit back and worry less, right? Over time, the long-term strategic uh, threat posed by China um, is maybe not as great as we've been thinking, or, uh, you know, what does this mean time-wise, but implications for U.S. businesses and U.S. policymakers, and how would that interpretation of what's happening maybe shift uh, in both of those areas? Um, so, Tom, what, what, what do you think? And then I'll, I'll turn to Okay. Um, well, let me let me start by Nadia. Your your point about should should we worry less, um, or is the threat not as great as we might might have thought? I I I don't think I would totally agree with that. Uh, China's very the leadership is very determined, and they've shown over the course of the last 40, 40 plus years that they're willing to pursue their long-term goals uh, very aggressively um, and use whatever means they, they see necessary uh, to achieve those goals. So I guess I would put the emphasis on, do they have the resources to pursue those goals? And I'm somewhat skeptical uh, that they can continue, for instance, with the, the, um, the uh, uh, massive an aggressive military buildup, and with programs um, of uh, e expansion into uh, the rest of the world through the Belt and Road Program, where they're providing a fair amount of uh, aid and uh, to other countries to acquire, uh, to help those countries develop, but also to uh, often to acquire assets. Um, that are useful to their to their own economy. So, I, I guess my my larger point, um, and I'll try to turn to addressing Leland's uh, suggestions as well here, 
my larger point is it's such an uh, accumulation of problems um, that uh, I, I doubt whether or not they have the resources um, to uh, accomplish everything they want to accomplish. Um, there's always been a question and Leland is probably a much more uh, an expert on this than I am, but you know, throughout Chinese history, there, 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 there are these history, there are these problems of social unrest, the so-called mandate of heaven. Uh, in my paper, I gave a few statistics on what we can see about social unrest. But uh, I guess my larger point is that some of these structural problems um, environmental degradation, uh, demography, um, inequality, they contribute to the weakening, I think, of at least the growth path, the, the strong growth path, and maybe even worse than that. But also the, there is a potential for some uh, social, uh, social unrest. I don't think any of us know um, uh, where that might go. But um, uh, I, I raise that as, as a question. I don't, it, it would be very difficult for any world leader faced with that uh, uh, conglomeration of problems to uh, manage everything. Now, with regard to uh, Leland's point about uh, a, a Lehman moment, I, I, I can't argue with, with that. Um, I shied away from taking a firm stand in my own paper on that because I don't think it's predictable. I sometimes think of you know, uh, Hemingway's famous uh, utterance about uh, bankruptcy uh, happening slowly over time, then all of a sudden, and that's sort of what happened in the United States in 20, 2008. But be, being able to predict that, um, uh, I think is difficult. I think the question is, do they have the financial resources uh, internally, Leland made reference to the, uh, you know, it's a non, uh, uh, non market system. It's an authoritarian system. But if they keep printing money, um, there's a lot, some chance that it would lead to some sort of inflation, even hyperinflation and the worst case scenario, which again would contribute to some social uh, unrest. And I mean, the, the Chinese people putting so much of their wealth into real estate, for instance, if there's a, uh, the bubble bursts there and their, their uh, resources that they have available to them to meet the shortages of the pension and medical system uh, in their old age, that, that could cause some uh, uh, unrest. Um, I guess the other uh, question is, I think they need to, uh, re and they seem to realize this, uh, but there is a need for foreign capital. Um, some of that um, uh, acquisition of uh, en entry into foreign markets for stocks, bonds, and venture capital funds is designed to uh, acquire technology, but some of it is just because they want to diversify their, their funding base. Um, the part of the other sort of general thrust, thrust of my paper is that a lot of their policies antagonize uh, their biggest trading partners. And even um, some of the countries in the Belt and Road Initiative that they're trying to help uh, at some point or another sometimes realize that they're being exploited. So if Western economies and other economies push back, then this ability to both export their excess product and to acquire uh, um, f financial uh, help, I, I think is diminished. So all of this just uh, uh, flows into uh, s some skepticism on my part about whether or not in the sort of the medium term they're gonna be able to handle all of these issues. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, Leland, I'd like you to go back and answer specifically, you know, your, the. The relationship between longer-term economic stagnation and implications for U.S. businesses, especially given you know BlackRock and the companies that have been quite bullish on staying in China, more in China, going into China um, amidst um, you know most of that discussion.
currently human rights, ESG issues, but this issue of longer term stagnation, how does that affect um, you know, their positions and, and really what, they're, what you think they're thinking? Um, and then I would like to get into BRI, but let's wait a little bit because I'd like to then talk about some of the policy um, points that Tom, uh, that the paper is uh, talking about, thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, you, you asked the question earlier, you know, does if Tom's right, if, if, what I, if I'm right about all the things we're saying today, uh, is this reason to worry less? Uh, no, I think it's, it's reason to worry more, uh, particularly on the policymaking side. Um, you know, Wall Street, you, met, you, you, know, you asked about Wall Street. I think when, when the corporate community, when the financial firms are looking at China, they, they are, they have always been way too bullish. They continue to be way too bullish. But as the realization of this sort of long-term stagnation sinks in, and this may not hit, you know, stagnation is something that takes a few years to get in. You're going to see precipitously de uh, declining growth in a few years. Uh, that stagnation will be take a little bit longer to, 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 to recognize. Uh, but I think when you look at China as a market, uh, there are still fantastic opportunities. There are still ways to make money. There are still places that they could open up in which individuals and firms and companies could do very, very well. So is this mean it's a, not a land of opportunities? It's something that the business community is going to turn away from? Uh, I don't think that at all. I think that there's still going to be very, uh, very distinct opportunities and ways to make money uh, for the Chinese consumer, although that has been overhyped from, from day one. Um, but there, there, there's, there's plenty of opportunities there. It just can't be based on the idea that there is this rising China monolith that's going to grow. It's at 8% or 7% or 6% or 5% or even 4% going forward. Uh, it's going to be an, a Chinese economy that's going to slow down dramatically. Uh, if the leadership does it right, it'll be slower but healthier growth. Uh, there will be industries in which there's there's enormous uh, enormous um, uh, uh, enormous opportunities for foreign companies. Uh, green the green world, you know green universe is 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 the most obvious one. But private healthcare, other things. So 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 it's it's not that it's not that uh, Wall Street and, and and the corporate community are wrong across the board on this. They just have to understand that they're going to have to be uh, have a nuanced view. Uh, they're going to have to understand their slowing growth overall, and they're going to have to be very picky on their opportunities instead of jumping in with both feet and eyes closed, which is what a lot of firms have been doing for the last 20 years. Um, I think the challenges for policymakers is much more significant because, you know, when we're talking about uh, a, a rising China and, and the threats there, I think something's more dangerous than a rising China, and that is a, a China that's realizing that it's coming close to peaking. Because a, a China that's coming close to peaking is going to look at itself, look at its goals, and say, we have a narrowing window here. You know, we, we don't have all the time in the world. You know, this idea that we've got 5,000 years of history or another 50 or 100 years to claim Taiwan, you know, some of these things are, aren't true. You know, we may have a limited window to this. So does that speed up China's aggressiveness? in the South China Sea or in terms of Taiwan? Uh, does it mean it's going to have to act more aggressively because of all these economic challenges pouring down? Will it have to rally around the flag by, by being aggressive towards its neighbors? Uh, the demographic challenges you have, there, there's, there's far too old, many old people in, in, in China, but there's also a major gender imbalance. So will there, will there be so many men in China that they're, they're wreaking havoc on, 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 on neighbors? In terms of uh, you know seeking seeking mar uh, marriage mates uh, across the borders, there's a lot of things that a that a suffering or a slowing or a peaking China uh, can can um, a lot of problems that the, that it can pose that are more serious even than a China that continues rising for another five, ten, or fifteen or twenty years. So I think this is this is such an important conversation because there's a tendency to see a rising China and just assume that China is going to rise forever. Uh, you certainly read the headlines and that's what everyone in, in the financial media thinks. Uh, but it's 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 the arguments in this paper talking about the structural challenges to, to continued high growth, to the, the structural challenges to continued uh, social stability uh, that are really the things weighing on the leadership in Beijing. And this should be the mindset. This should be the lens through which U.S. policymakers are looking at the Chinese economy and the Chinese leadership, because they may have to deal with the China in five or 10 years. It looks very, very different than what they're reading in the newspapers. So the instability, planning for instability associated with, uh, with stagnation and weakness. And a, narrow, and a narrowing window uh, for a, a China that thinks that maybe our, our advantages uh, have, have, have been increasing up to a certain point, say 2030, 2035, but a slowing economy and demographic challenges and other means that the opportunities 
the opportunity window for aggressive action, say Taiwan or something else, may be limited going forward. And so we have to prepare sooner rather than later to do something. So Tom, do you agree? I mean, specifically on Taiwan, sort of a sense that our, um, that that the window may be closing, that there is a danger of a more aggressive China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Not to put you on the spot, but that's sort of basically what Lee yeah, was saying. I, I, so I, I put you on the spot. <laughs> no, I, I think there is, that's, that's a real danger that we have to think about quite, uh, quite deeply. And Nadia, I'd like to hear what your, your view on that. Well, Let me. <laughs> the beauty of the moderator is I, I don't have to answer any questions, <laughs> so, but I would like to go into some policy, some of the policy implications, because Tom, you talk about, you have 16 pretty specific, very interesting kind of policy recommendations. Um, Leland, what I found interesting about your points was that essentially, not to put words in your mouth, but what, what I interpreted your comments were that we should actually be pretty narrow in our policy toolkit and focus in certain areas. I think it's fair to say Tom's were, you know, much broader, everything from um, rejoining, um, uh, you know, uh, TPP to, to uh, just working with European allies, a you know, much broader set of recommendations. Is that fair? Is there maybe some difference between the two of you on those? Look, I, I actually agree with Tom's recommendations. Okay. I, my, on the top level, the way to approach what are the best solutions? I think they have to be looked at from a narrow rather than broad view, rather than just a, you know, anything bad for China is good for the United States, which, which clearly hasn't proven itself true over time, uh, that you have to look at, uh, you know, how do we address Chinese malfeasance? How do we address Chinese misbehavior? How do we prohibit uh, or restrict the, the Chinese, Chinese uh, leadership from getting access to advanced tech that, that, that'll, that'll cause us pain down the road? Those are the sort of the threshold questions. But when you go, when you talk about working with allies and joining trade packs that make sense and other things, uh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's a, it's a broad-based strategy, but it has to come from an idea that you have to really go at things that are in America's interest and not just anti-China, because that'll, that'll bring you down a, a dark road. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I, uh, my perspective is that <clears throat> partly that we have to focus on what our larger overall goal is with China. I mean, for the first, uh, what, 20, 30 years of the, the, the modern regime, if you will, since Deng Xiaoping, we, ha we had a, a hope, let's, let's put it that way, that they would gradually um, be more integrated into the sort of economic system and geopolitical system that had served the world fairly well since it was set up after the first World or the second world war. I think what we have learned, um, especially in the last 20 years is that China is not going down that path. Um, and I take seriously the Chinese expressions of uh, long-term goals of things like self-sufficiency and through the Made in China 2025 uh, program of being uh, the world leading firms and the, the leading technologies of the future. So one can interpret that, and I am closer to this interpretation, uh, that China really uh, wants to, to uh, actually fulfill those ambitions be the world leader, become more self-sufficient. So then that leads back to what should the business community think? And Leland is that, you know, certainly right that at the moment in the last 20 years, a lot of American and European firms especially have done quite well in the Chinese market. Uh, Tesla is I think the leading seller of EVs in, in China. Uh, Apple overtook Huawei again as the leading seller of uh, advanced phones in China this year. But I think that window is going to continue to narrow as China tries to um, develop their own indigenous technology and wean themselves from dependence on, on the West. So I think the business community needs to take that into consideration. Now, with regard, with regard to the policy prescriptions, you know, I, I sort of have tried to think of this in terms of the dual goals. One, protecting national security um, and uh, challenging China's um, uh, misuse uh, or 
disregard for its obligations that it's entered into, for instance, in the World Trade Organization, things like subsidization, theft of intellectual property. I mean, it's pretty clear that we can fight back against that. Um, what, what I'm a little bit more uh, ambiguous about is um, going forward as China makes this, um, uh, tries to achieve the goal of self-sufficiency. Uh, I think she calls it the dual circulation economy. They want to uh, uh, retain access to Western markets, uh, South Asian markets for that matter. Um, but can our policies um, um, induce them, uh, incent them to back off from that uh, um, drift away or sprint away in some cases from the standards of the World Trade Organization of the Bretton Woods institutions that we had thought they might uh, embrace. So um, I think we do have tools. Um, I, I think access to foreign capital is somewhat underestimated as, as a tool. And since the Chinese um, you know, adamantly refuse to use uh, Western accounting standards for issuing um, um, both uh, equity and debt on our markets, a simple thing to do would be to require them rigorously to meet the uh, disclosure transparency requirements that uh, Western firms have to meet. Um, we can use uh, trade policy. And as I tried to emphasize in some of my remarks, I think it's not just the United States that is uh, increasingly aware of China's um, uh, abdication of its responsibilities of the World Trade Organization and World Health Organization for that matter. Um, others are, are uh, fighting back. All of these actions, if we took them, could do, I think, significant harm to, to the Chinese economy. So um, mm -hmm. it, it, it sort of depends on how, how one interprets China's long-term goals. And I guess I'm a little bit more on the pessimistic side in the sense so, that I think they're moving uh, toward self-sufficiency and want to keep moving that way. Can so I do you agree on... with yeah? Do you agree with that, Leland, on, on the on the interpretation of self-sufficiency? Um, you know, the objectives of dual circulation, essentially what Tom is saying is that China's driving decoupling and actually has been for a long time. Um, and then also if you could comment on, you know, obstacles to our efforts of, of people out there trying to get more transparency. Um, on, into Chinese companies and why it's been four years of some really smart people arguing for that and what's what's stopping that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what, uh, what 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 Tom has been saying. Your for your, your initial question was on on, on which point I, I was just running. Oh, and if you if you um, so do you agree with the with the, well what are the objectives of of China vis a vis its dual circulation policy? It's drive ah, okay. for right, right, decoupling. Right. So the resilient the decoupling. The coupling is coming from China really much more than from the U.S. Um, yeah. And, I, I, yeah, no, I, uh, I yeah, I, I look, I agree, I agree with that, um, you know, and I think that because it's such an important uh, goal for China, I think that should be the focus of U.S. policy. Um, you know, a, a way to look at this, I think, if we just take a step back, is that you know, a U.S. the U.S. has a, it's got its problems, but it has a, a an innovation economy. It it's it 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 it, it drives you know, technological advancement. It drives innovation. The Chinese economy is not terribly good at that. There, there's some big champions, and I don't want to undermine the, the, the great tech giants they have. Uh, but but in a in a one on one even playing field, the U.S. model, this innovation economy model, will beat this market, uh, this this non market authoritarian model. You know, 90, 95 percent of the time. Uh, the problem is, is that when you have a system uh, like China's, you have the ability for the state to put a very firm finger uh, on the scales in very specific ways. And what we've seen uh, is some, you know, used to be called Made in China 2025 until the, the, the Chinese banned uh, the term a few years ago. Um, it was this was this extraordinary drive for, for self-sufficiency, for self-reliance uh, on all the things that are going to make up this next industrial revolution. You know, we're talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, 5G, uh, robotics, quantum, uh, biotech, all, all these very, very important uh, top elite tier level manufacturing issues. 
And the problem with the US competing on an even playing field with China is it's of course not an even playing field. And so the focus of US policy should be to make sure that these backdoor subsidies are being uh, are being combated. You know, if, the, if, if Huawei is receiving, I remember the Wall Street Journal did this uh, expose on all the subsidies, the, the tens of billions of dollars of subsidies Huawei's gotten uh, over the over the years, uh, how Chinese foreign policy, part of Chinese foreign policy was pushing Huawei into other country, country, countries so that their 5G would be run by, uh, by a Chinese company. Uh, this is the type of thing in which U.S. policy will need to step up and push back on in order, uh, in, in order to, you see the compete, 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 but, but sometimes you have to push back against, against the Chinese finger on the scales. Uh, and that's, that's where this is a particular problem. It's in the, 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 the high level advanced tech made in China 2025 issues. Uh, and that's the reason, again, why I think export control should be a word that everybody's talking about in their kitchens, policymakers are not, because you can talk about all these other tools, but at the end of the day, you know, if we're allowing China to get access to certain advanced technologies, and then they use those advanced technologies to beat us, um, then, you know, who, who, who's at fault here? And I think, I think people need to understand the importance of export controls and, and take them a lot more seriously as, as a fundamental uh, tenet of, of U.S. policy. Tom, did you um, did you want to comment on that? I mean, you have you have a, a, among your policy recommendations. I I think you agree with that point of view, correct? Uh, I sure do. Um... Um, so I want to give everyone a chance to sort of wrap as as we um, end our our hour. Um, I did want to ask um, a couple more questions, though, quick questions. I mean, um, Belt Road Initiative, Tom, in your report, you talk about that essentially as a liability for China down the line. Uh, Leland, um, you know, quickly, do you agree with that uh, that assessment? I do. Uh, I think Belt and Road was created in a very different era. Uh, when, when, when Xi Jinping first sort of adopted it as his own, you know, the, the, the talk, market talk was about how China's, you know, for, Forex reserves were, were you know, approaching f uh, $4 trillion and, and, and there was too many and they'd have to figure out a way to get them down and, and we're going to send all this money abroad, we're going to recycle, uh, you know, Chinese surpluses abroad and, 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 uh, and, and that's not the world we live in anymore. Uh, I think they, they realize, I think the, the, the leadership over there realizes uh, that they've, uh, they've gone too big on this, uh, that doesn't make sense uh, with, their, with their current priorities at home. Uh, it, it's also a, a bad idea overall. So for all the soft power and, and advantages that this might have and, and certain, certain, I guess, hard power advantages, uh, look, there's one thing that, that, that the Chinese leaders have never been good at, and that is striking deals to, that, have, that, are, that are economic. I mean, most of the stuff, you look at what happened in Venezuela and, and Central Asia and, and South Asia, and they're, they're money losing enterprises. There's money that's being just lost abroad. And so uh, Belt and Road uh, never really made sense, but at least it, 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 it made sense a little bit in the context of when it was, you know, five plus years ago when it was being, uh, when it was being developed. Now, I think it's a liability that the Chinese can't completely walk away from because Xi Jinping associated himself personally with it. Uh, but I think they're very happy to have this play a smaller and smaller role in, in Chinese foreign policy going forward because it's, uh, it's, it's just not, it's not paying off. It's, it's, it's a money pit. So related could, could to I, that, is I could I comment help? on that? Yeah, sure. I, just quickly, I, one of the interesting things I came across um, in, in doing this work was a lot of research on sort of the the uh, uh, the efficiency uh, of infrastructure uh, development, both internally in China and externally through Belt and Road, um, and most of the economic studies that I, I came across indicated that uh, by and large, these things weren't as productive. The return on investment was generally a lot less than uh, what they had anticipated. So a large, large part of the Chinese thinking about growth uh, over the last 40 years has been building infrastructure. They've done a great job internally in China but they're continuing to put money into that in, in, and into uh, foreign markets as well for infrastructure. It's another example of how it's really a misallocation of capital, I think, at this point in time. And again, it undermines their ability to have strong growth going, going forward. 
Related to that, often um, part of the U.S. discussion of Belt Road Initiative has been a discussion of the of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I noticed, you know, in your recommendations, you advocated uh, that the U.S. should rejoin. Um, and that's actually been a controversial view, right? It's been bipartisanly controversial. Um, so could you comment a little bit more about that? And then Leland, I'd like your view on, on that, on rejoining and the advantages or disadvantages to the U.S. Um, and then we really um, will wrap. Thanks. Okay, Nadia, thanks. Um, I, I know it's been controversial. Uh, uh, it's been a controversy between myself and some of my best friends in the policymaking community for a long time. Um, the, much of the reason for uh, rejecting the uh, TPP, um, as you know yourself, was uh, the uh, potential impact on the US manufacturing sector which has been over the last 25, 30 years, hard hit by the, the competition from China. Some of it, uh, as Leland mentioned, heavily subsidized, but some of it just um, their ability to produce things at a, a better price than uh, we were able to do. Now, uh, the, uh, I've come to the conclusion though that, um, that China is, now so big, such a big economy, and they've managed to build up relationships, uh, sometimes under some duress, but relationships, trading relationships, for instance, with ASEAN um, or with Europe, where there's enough mutually beneficial trade at the moment uh, for them to uh, not want to take on China. I think we need to... Um, uh, gradually whittle away at this advantage that China has. And we can't do that unless we're in a, some sort of a more constructive trading uh, agreement on trade, especially with our Asian partners. And I would put India into that basket, even though they're not a member of the, uh, the successor to the TPP. Um, and also I, I've argued as many have argued, we need to gradually try to convince the Europeans that the Chinese are more of a threat to their economy than they are an, an advantage. So it's for a lot of those reasons that I, I think we do need to get back into uh, what was used to be called the TPP. The Japanese, the Australians um, are uh, really uh, working very hard to try to convince us to do that. And it's a sign that they don't want to become too um, dependent on uh, trade with China. Thanks, Tom. So Leland, um, what's your view on CPTPP? Yeah, it's unfortunate that the political discourse is what it is. And it's, you know, TPP has become this, this job killing boogeyman. Uh, TPP was, was probably never as important as, as some of its advocates uh, uh, pushed, it, it certainly was never as bad as its detractors try to sell it for. Um, I, I think that, you know, I wish uh, the way people would look at these agreements would be more uh, as who do we want to control the rules of the road? Who's Whose rules do we want? Do we want to be established in the relationships and having 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 our rules control the international bodies, standards, trade agreements, or do we want to cede that ground to others, most obviously China? Uh, I think that, that that part of this has been missing the last several years. Um, I, you know, I don't think that, um, uh, I, I think we're, we're just at a very politicized moment on this, that when people turn around and they ask themselves, you know, do, are we going to want to get in a good trade agreement uh, with our allies in Asia and abroad, uh, particularly if, if the, if the, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the, the opposite outcome is, is for, is for China to, to be, to be controlling these relationships. Certainly it pushes us to, to, to be in bigger, stronger trade agreements going forward. So I'm hoping that this, uh, that this, uh, the, this politicized atmosphere over trade, which 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 has happened off and on for decades, centuries, I guess, uh, you know, click clicks clicks back off after a while, and we can actually look at agreements uh, for for their merits alone, and not not based on on this uh, the, the discourse, most of which is wrong. Uh, thank you both. So I'll um, I will wrap now. I think if I had to if I had to identify sort of one takeaway from the discussion, or met someone and said, "Well, Tom's report is really about essentially shifting our frame of reference from one of China's strength to the implications of growing Chinese weaknesses." Right. 
and ultimately the implications of that, the policy implications of that, the, the, um, and the implications for the United States and its allies down the line. So that would be sort of my, my, um, my big takeaway. Hopefully it's somewhat accurate, Tom. And, um, and Leland, what's, uh, what's yours? And then we'll turn to Tom and we'll say goodnight. Right. Well, you know, it's, it, it's been, um, I, I think, I think Tom hit the nail on the head in terms of identifying all the big challenges that, uh, that, that China has, many more than I think people understand because they're so used to the, the, the rhetoric of, of a rising China. Uh, China has some very severe challenges uh, over the coming years that he's gonna have to, it's going to have to deal with. And, and where does this bring us? Um, I think one of the problems with, with, again, the narrative that people are pushing is people just say a slowing China. And they don't know what that means, and and um, and and so everybody's going to be right because there's almost nobody saying China's going to speed up. So everyone just sort of says the you know on, on the side of their side of their mouth, oh, China's slowing, and and, and everyone's predictions are going to be right. So what does that mean? Well, I, I found it very interesting because it is time and time again, uh, people are I think underestimating the severity of the slowdown that is coming. Uh, 2022 is a political year, so I don't expect to see this during the you know sh sh the year of Xi's uh, re -recor recoronation. Uh, but 2023 and beyond, I think that the pressures on the Chinese economy from moving away from from property and reckless credit expansion and a lot of the things that that the Chinese economic model has stood for, but I don't think is going to stand for going forward. I think you're going to see a much more precipitous fall in growth. Uh, and I don't think this is going to be a matter of a tenth of a percentage point or something you may read in a Wall Street pamphlet, you know, just just tweaking down the growth numbers. I think you're going to see growth numbers fall quite dramatically over the coming years. Uh, and it's going to shock a lot of people if they're not identifying the types of problems that Tom has in his report and understanding that this is what Beijing is worried about. This is the lens through which Beijing is looking at their challenges going forward. And I think we need to be more, a bit more realistic on the U.S. side of, of, of what's going on. Thanks, Leland. Tom? to summarize your own report. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me thank both of you for your uh, incisive comments about this, uh, about the report. Um, and thank you for taking the time to, to uh, discuss this today. I thought it was a great conversation. I, I do agree with Leland that, that 2022 is probably not the year we're gonna see the, anything like an acute crisis, although it continues to build. Um, I guess my final comment would be, I think we in the United States, and hopefully in, if we can convince uh, some of our allies, especially the Europeans, to begin to think like us about China, we need to think about uh, how we can use the tools that are available to us, and I tried to um, uh, elaborate them in, in the report, to achieve uh, goals that we agree on, we in the, in the West. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if any of us know if we can convince the Chinese or Xi Jinping, who's likely to be there for a lot longer, to back off a little bit on their threats on, on Taiwan and their military aggressiveness. We have to think very deeply about that, but we do have some tools that could possibly uh, dissuade them by hurting them. And then, uh, to reflect on how much we think we can induce the Chinese to take a slightly different path, at least, in terms of their, their economic model. Uh, I think that model is headed for long-term slow growth, which will be not in the interests of the Chinese uh, political stability in China. Um, we have also have to recognize if we push too hard, China, and there is a, a, a real uh, Japan-like crisis or um, layman moment in China, that's gonna affect our economy as well. Um, so it's very delicate stuff, but we have to think about that, I, I think a lot more clearly and try to understand both the Chinese motives and what we can do to try to um, induce them to go on a path that, that leads to a little bit more global stability. Thanks, Tom. We could clearly actually have a whole other conversation about whether or not that could actually happen, right? I'm probably more skeptical. Another area we didn't talk about enough is really technology and how um, dominance in key tech sectors could actually maybe counteract uh, some of these developments. So clearly we will have to meet again. Uh, hopefully live um, over a, a meal or something. <laughs> and um, thank you both.
and best wishes for the new year and thanks to those watching.